As our US president addressed the current opioid crisis, I can't help but remember a past historical event that are so close to my home that we have started this drug war two centuries ago. Imagine in the late 18th century, early 19th century, we have an epidemic, not in the United States or South America, across the Pacific Ocean, all the way in Asia. Why did it happen? Who instigated it? What were the results and outcome after this conflict? Today, Mr. Toastmaster, guest, I would like to share with you a historical event that I would like to bring it back to life in modern U.S. history that you will see a parallel of the current opioid epidemic and also the past opium war. To bring everybody up to pace, the OPO occurred from between 1839 and 1842. It is a period of three-year events. This is not a single event, but a multi-year event that led up to the crisis, ended up with signing a treaty. There are subsequent war afterwards, after the humiliation that the Chinese government had suffered at the time. Today, we will focus on the first opium war that led to this event down the road when China was carved up by Western imperialism. So what instigated the opium war? It is a sequence of events. Towards the late 18th centuries, the British Empire was growing. They were trying to colonize the entire world. Fortunately, the United States gained independence towards the end. 1776, and British had lost all the colonies that needed to support it. The empire tried to expand, tried to find a new destination, and that new destination happened to be in China. The British immediately get a sensation of an addiction, an addiction of Chinese food, an addiction of tea, the addiction of the great portrait, gold, silver, and they ended up using the gold and silver they had mined out of their American colonies to pay for those luxury goods. Well, they may have had a great empire, but their coffers soon ran dry. Because of their addiction to the tea, they've decided perhaps they can trade something, do some deal with the Chinese government at the time. It was the Qing Dynasty. However, the Qing Dynasty was close to the outside world because the Chinese system encouraged a closed system. The Chinese did not believe foreign influences, did not believe they are on the same status or equal as the foreign influences. They believe they are higher, <coughs> but failed to recognize the British Empire have already colonized two thirds of the world. Even with a nice gesture from diplomats ambassador visiting, the Chinese government turned them down. So the British was frustrating. If you've been to England before, you knew how consistent, persistent British mindset is. It's bloody hell, have to be done, because we are serving the Queen at the time. They decided to look to one of their colonies between China and England. That colony was India. India at the time was owned by Britain, and they had a mass empire there called the East India Company, growing different products. And they decided, well, what kind of product will the Chinese accept? If it's cheap, easy to produce, and also, based on their lessons learned from the tea, had to be addicted. They soon discovered that. And that material is called opium. And for those of you who don't understand opium, I have another slide here to give you an idea what opium stands for. It is a drug. If you look at the current opium epidemic, Opium belongs to opiates. It is a derived substance, so poppy seed, growing in the field of India because of the climate. If you look at current drugs addiction, we use all these heroin, methamphetamine, the thing that Custom Border Patrol look at significantly. It's no different back then in two centuries ago, except we do it different, smoke it through a pipe. At this time, there was a growing addiction problem in China. People were suffering from poverty. They need a way to relieve pain. Think about it. Tylenol of the time. 
they had to have it. That became the downfall of the Chinese and also become the influx of British opium import into China. So you can see in the chart above, even before the war, we have seen an exponential growth of import, whether illegal or illegal import of opium into China. So this problem had been going on already for a long time. It is nothing subsequent that led to this event because the Chinese government began to take a well of it something is wrong, something is not right with my subject, something is wrong with the people, they are not being productive, they are getting high every day, not going to work. <laughs> if you think about Chinese at the time, yes, we are still manufacturing the world, even by today's standard, they are producing the world's economy, and if the Chinese not producing, then the economy fail. Another issue, remember the silver and gold that I earlier put on the slide, that the British has paid the Chinese, instead of Retaining those silver and gold treasury, they're using the same money that the British had paid them before to pay back the opium. Opium is cheap, easy to produce, and can accumulate in vast quantity. These are all measured in tons. At the time, the metric system was chest, so 140 pounds is a chest. They're bringing tons and tons, boatload of chest on shore every single day. Something had to be done. Now come the fun part. Who was involved before the Opium War? China at the time was ruled under the Qing Dynasty by the Emperor Qing Long. At the time, he see this issue epidemic but don't know what to do. Eventually, one of his subjects recommended a non-corruptible officer. His name is Lin Zhu Lin Zhechu. In English, it means Lin Zhechu. Let's just, just call him Mr. Lin for now. <laughs> That's nation. He's uncorruptible. British at the time was ruled by Queen Victoria. She also sent a delegate, Sir Charles Elliot, or Captain Elliot, at the time ruling of the Royal Navy. Well, Lin Zhu took it on the hardline subject, started to burn all the opium, just like what we have done in South America, burn all the drugs, and that angered the British. Of course, with peace being transitory at the time, war was inevitable to break up. British sent a navy along the coast of China, first starting the dispute in Canton, nowadays known as Guangzhou. In fact, the word Cantonese, the language that I speak from home, is made up by British. It wasn't even Chinese. Later, they sent their fleet all the way up to Chusan, which is very close to the port of Shanghai. They destroyed both of them, eventually make their way to Nanking. This expedited the war developments from, 19, from 1839 to 1842. When the British colonized Nanking, they decided to split it into their service, the supply line in China. And now the Chinese government began to worry. Well, they have decided to do several negotiations, failed, war fought again, Failed again to negotiate, war fought again, so not like the Korean War. It drags on until 19, 1842, where the signing of the Treaty of Nanking, where a set of unequal treaty was signed by the Chinese government. Unequal meaning the Chinese government has to give up land, give up territory, give up money, pay reparations to the war. This begins this chain of event of unequal treatment. It's because of the failure to stop opium. Now this has a long effect to my homeland in Hong Kong. The British took Hong Kong, eventually expanded it, going through the area of three different centuries from 19th, 20th to the 21st century, turning it into a financial hub, which is a good thing. While the downside is we have a cultural understanding that this is different. We are subjugated under the British Empire feel a little bit different than mainland China. What happened to China itself? It took a long time to rebound. By the outbreak of the first Opium War, Chinese controls over 30% of the world's GDP. If you look at the trend towards 2014, even with being the second largest manufacturer in the world, we cannot, we had not surpassed back in 1842 when the outbreak of the war ended it. When the Opium pouring you see the negative effect to the population, to the country. 
also to the culture. It has a long-lasting effect. Now, bringing all this history back to life, back to nowadays presence, what do you see in parallel? You have multiple drug heads, I call them drug lords, El Chapo, Pablo Escobar, all that. I mean, at least El Chapo is still alive, but think about the worth, net worth they have gained over the time. One billion, 30 billion, and then look at the British Empire. I especially put the words down, the sun never set. Sun did set in 1997. That was the time when Hong Kong was finally given back to the Chinese government. It took over 150 years. That is a long time being subjected under a colonization. But think about the money they have made out of it. Why do you think drugs had this issue? Drug problem cannot be solved by simply cutting off the supply. But you had to go to the root cause to solve the issue of the drug. The demand, why is there a demand? The Chinese government eventually was able to solve this issue by using an alternative way to push the people out of poverty, push them out of drug addiction, going through rehab after rehab that you have never seen before in the 20th century to push the opium epidemic away. At present, we're facing a current opium crisis in the United States. I believe we can do the similar things. Instead of eliminate these sources, treat the demand, treat the people affected underneath, rather than cutting off these supply because you cannot kill them all. Believe me, the British Empire, they've been going on so long, we're trying to take them down through the walls and things, they're still alive. And they still have that commonwealth, they call themselves, commonwealth of empire today. In conclusion, I would like to give a special thanks to this um, YouTube channel that I have followed. They do a lot of historical context. If you're interested in knowing more about this opium war, plus other historical events, I encourage you to look it up on YouTube. Take a look. It's great to educate yourself in history and also helping you to bring history back into context, back into modern day, and back into life. Mr. Toast, Mr. Toastmaster.